Hey, this is Bree Noble of the Female Musician Academy, and you are listening to the Musicality Podcast. Ever wondered why some people seem to have a gift for music? Have you ever wished that you could play by ear, sing in tune, improvise and jam? You're in the right place. Time to turn those wishes into reality. Welcome to the Musicality Podcast with your host, Christopher Sutton. Hi, this is Christopher, founder of Musical You, and welcome to the Musicality Podcast. One of the parts of Musicality that we haven't covered so much on the podcast so far is the topic of performing and finding ways to share the music you love, perhaps even music you've written yourself, with an audience. Now, if you've been listening to the show for a while, then you know I'm not about to tell you that there is one single correct path to follow and that all serious musicians should do it a certain way when it comes to performing or publishing music. But I do think that whatever way, shape or form it may take for you, music is fundamentally about the human connection and finding a way to share your music making is one of the most rewarding things you can do in your musical life. Today I'm joined by Brie Noble, who, as well as being an award-winning singer-songwriter, is the founder of the Female Musician Academy and the host of two popular podcasts, Women of Substance Radio and the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast, both of which I listen to myself. Brie is a total expert on a couple of topics that may be of interest to you. If you've had the urge to perform as a musician or to share music you've created yourself, but you haven't known where to start, or you've worried it's too late for you, or you've wondered if it might even be possible to make some money with your music. In this conversation, we talk about Bree's own journey of struggling to figure out how to make a living with music. The barriers and concerns that hold musicians back from getting their music out there and getting paid. And the sheer variety of options available today for getting your music heard, for building up your presence as an artist, and for making money with the music you love. I also ask Bree something you might have wondered yourself on hearing the names of her projects a moment ago, which is why she's particularly passionate about helping female musicians specifically, and the advantages that come from focusing in on women in music. This is a conversation which is sure to open some new doors in your mind and spark inspiration about what your own musical life could look like, so please enjoy. My name is Christopher Sutton, and this is the Musicality Podcast from Musical You. Welcome to the show, Vri. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm super thrilled to be here. So these days, you're very well known for helping musicians get their music out there and discover ways to potentially make some money with their music, whether that's online or offline or whatever way, shape or form. But I don't know so much about your own musical story. Could you tell us a little bit about your musical beginnings and how you got started learning music? Um, well, I think, you know, I always loved music. I was always musical. It didn't actually come from a musical family. So I don't know where that came from. Um, but, you know, growing up, I always sang in church. I was in church musicals, but I didn't really get into it until high school. I found my footing and my place in the world, I think, when I discovered choirs in high school. Um, I had been I've been taking this art class when I first got to high school and I was terrible at it. Like my mom's an artist and I have no shred of artistic ability. I discovered after a few weeks in the class and I was like, I need to get out of this class. What can I do? And so uh, I had been taking a beginner choir class and I went to my choir teacher and I said, is there any way you can get me out of this class? Can you get me into concert choir? I know it's the same period. And she was able to pull some strings and get me out of art, which was like the best thing ever. Um, and then I discovered how much I absolutely loved choirs. And from that point, I was in every choir that the school offered, which was like four different choirs and a, a girls barbershop quartet and solos and, you know, everything that I could do in choir, I did. Nice. I can totally relate to that. In my school days, it was playing rugby that <laughs> I was trying to get out of by taking more music <laughs> classes and it, it paid off nicely. <laughs> So you were singing a lot in your school days and choirs and a cappella. Where did things go from there? Were you determined to become a musician as a career? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know that I wanted to do it as a career. I just knew that I was going to go to college and music is what I loved. So I didn't see why I shouldn't pursue that in college. Um, at that point, I'd kind of learned enough about my voice to to know that I could probably be a vocal major. And so 
Um, I had chosen to go to Westmont College, which is a small liberal arts school in Santa Barbara, mostly because I wanted to go to that school, not necessarily because of the music department, although I looked into it. It was a small department. I felt comfortable there. And I, I knew that I wanted to do something in music. I wasn't sure if I wanted to be a music teacher or, um, you know, be a singer songwriter or be a opera singer. You know, I had no idea. I just knew that I wanted to be in. And I also at that point thought I might want to be like a studio um, producer or something like that. I was interested in the technology. So I just figured out, I'll just go to college and figure it out once I get there. (laughs) And did that work? It did. It did. So I, um, I auditioned for the school's performing, like elite performing ensemble. We were kind of this weird hodgepodge of like a Christian contemporary band and an acapella group. So we did both of those things. Um, there was 12 members and we were kind of the ambassadors for the school. And so I got into that group as a coming in freshman, which was uncommon. And so it got my feet wet in performing. And I also learned how to be in front of an audience, you know, how to talk to the audience, how to introduce a song. And, you know, that was all new to me. And so I, I absolutely like learned everything that I know now, not everything I know now, but like the basis of what I know now about being on stage in those four years of being in that traveling ensemble, we traveled like every other weekend. We took a few longer trips to to Colorado for a spring break and things like that, where we just performed like two, three times a day. Wow, that's intense. And that all sounds very smooth and easy. Were there any challenges along the way for you as you were learning? Um, Yeah, I mean, plenty of challenges. Um, One thing is that I, I have glaucoma, so I have low vision. So as I was you know, immersed in all these choirs and learning all this music for this ensemble at Westmont, I basically had to memorize every piece of music because I wasn't able to perform with music it was just too small like no no glasses could fix the problem that I was super nearsighted so it it was really good because it allowed me to develop my memory and um, you know when you're in high school choir you're expected to memorize everything and when you're performing on stage like you're not generally using music unless maybe you're an instrumentalist Um, and I did play a little bit of piano in that group but I had to memorize it and it was it was all a really good experience for my future work as a soloist and stuff because I never relied on music which allowed me to communicate better with the audience and even now you know I'll sing a duet with someone and she'll have music and I won't and I know that I'm communicating better with the audience than she is and it's not her fault it's just that you know she's used to that crutch. That's interesting yeah it's it's one of the reasons we often recommend working on your musical memory and trying to memorize the pieces you're playing because I think there's an argument that says you only really start to perform it when you take your eyes off the page and it's inside your head. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, That's Yep. And it's weird how memory works, too, for me. Sometimes if I'm in a crunch to memorize something because I didn't start on it for a week before, I'll, I'll get it in time for the performance and I'll, I'll have it enough in my head that at least if I can't remember it all like this, I'll remember it right before I need to sing or whatever. But then my memory keeps working on it and I'm constantly singing it all week long. And, you know, by a week after that, I could sing it anywhere, anytime because it's so burned in my memory. So it was the eye condition that put you down this path of focusing on memorization. Was that something that came easy to you or was it something you had to work on? Because it's so often a bugbear for musicians that they really struggle Mm -hmm. to memorize. I mean, I think it came easy for me only out of necessity. Like, you know, my entire life, I memorized a lot of things because I couldn't read the board in class. And, you know, so I would tend to like listen to what the teacher was saying and immediately commit it to memory because I hate taking notes uh, again with the the low vision, like I'd write notes, but they would look like chicken scratch because it was harder for me to, you know, see what I was writing while I was writing it to write neatly. And so I think I've always just kind of developed my memory over the years. I see. And how did those college years go for you? How were you developing as a singer? Well, I was developing as a classical singer. So it, at that point I didn't, I was doing this, I had this total dichotomy thing going on where I was singing 
um, you know, classical music and my lessons, art, songs and, and opera. And I was actually doing a few operas uh, on the stage. But then I was singing in this contemporary and acapella ensemble on the weekends. So it was it was an interesting, I think it was good because it forced me or kept me in the world of pop music where I really ultimately wanted to be. And had I not had that, I might have become so classically minded and so stuck in my classical ways that I couldn't have gone on to have the singer songwriter career that I did have that I actually wanted. And nowadays you're known particularly for helping independent musicians get out there, get more well-known and in a lot of cases make a living or a career from their music. For you, what did that journey look like when you were leaving college, you had your music degree, you knew you wanted to sing? Was, was it an easy path from there or looking back? <laughs> looking <laughs> back like a total it disaster. <laughs> let's, let's be clear. Like I had no clue. I had no guidance I mean, I'm not knocking the school that I went to, but they, I had a double degree in music and business. And on either side, they pretty much gave me no career guidance whatsoever on how to get a job, on how to pursue things in my major. So I was thrust into uh, living in a place that I didn't know anyone. So I had no connections because I ended up following my husband as he went to graduate school. And I, I moved to a totally new place, knew no one. And had no idea how to go about even pursuing a career, whether it was in music or business. Um, and so I just, I tried everything. You know, I would put ads in the recycler. I would try to connect with people that had bands. I, um, you know, would try to get jobs singing at weddings, but I didn't really know how to promote myself in any way to, to make that further than one gig. And this really went on for years. I mean, that's the one reason, one of the reasons that I have the programs that I have now, because I don't want musicians to suffer like I did. I had no clue how to get out there and, and make a career and make money in music back in, you know, the mid nineties. So it was kind of, I worked a regular job. Um, I ended up getting uh, a position as a director of finance at an opera company, which was fantastic as far as the fact that I got to see free operas and got to go to these fancy parties and hang out with artistic people. Um, but again, like all this time, I wanted to be a singer songwriter. I wanted to perform like all these opera singers were doing. They were living their dream and I was watching them and handing them paychecks. So, you know, I wanted to figure out, I was always on the side, you know, doing demos for people, trying to, you know, trying out these different band opportunities. Um, but the one thing that I was really doing wrong all that time is I wasn't trying to build my own career. I was trying to fit myself into someone else's mold. I was trying to be in someone else's band because I thought they knew better than I did how to promote, you know, and how to be a part of the music industry. I didn't have any confidence in myself as a solo artist. I didn't have enough knowledge to actually go market myself as a solo artist. And so I was constantly trying to like hang on other people's coattails, which always ended up you know, in ending in disaster, whether it was, you know, a, a few weeks in a band or a few years, it always just kind of self-destructed. <laughs> gotcha. And that said, you, you had a very successful career as a singer songwriter, you know, you're an award-winning songwriter. You were on tour for several years. Um, you, I think you sang the national anthem before a baseball game. These are, these are big highlights. Uh, how did you manage to have such, such success if it wasn't um, a clear path laid out for you? Yeah. I mean, it was really me like taking the bull by the horns eventually and saying like enough of this I'm done. Obviously I've tried all these other paths and they're not working. Um, it coincided with me leaving the opera because I had a one-year-old and I was dealing with a lot of stress in that job. And so I decided to take a leap and um, quit my job stay home with my daughter. And that gave me the time to really kind of study things. I kind of started watching other artists that were doing what I wanted to do and, and following them and seeing what they were doing. 
and trying to emul- emulate what they were doing. Um, I started asking for advice and joining a group, mentoring groups where I could learn what I needed to do. And then I just like put the fear aside. You know, I said, look, if I'm, if, if it, it was that point where you're like 32 and you're like, either I'm going to do this or I just need to give up on this idea forever because I'm at kind of this crossroads point. And so I just said, I'm going to get in the trenches. I'm going to do like this, you know, the, the groundwork that I need to do and start a grassroots marketing effort for my own music. And it involved, you know, writing my first like real album where I had been kind of recording some stuff from home and putting it out on mp3.com and things like that. And there was some momentum there, but not a lot, but it, it gave me a lot of good practice in writing and things and recording myself. And, you know, then I finally recorded my first real professional album and just started getting out there and not being afraid to like call people up and get bookings and, um, you know, rally people around me and start an email list, you know, all the things that I really needed to do to create a movement for my music that I hadn't been doing. And the way you described it there, you made it sound like, you know, this was the end of the window for being able to do that. You know, you hit the ripe old age of 32 and it was now or never. And clearly (laughs) that kind of lit a fire under you, which is great. But I'm imagining someone listening who maybe is 10 or 20 years further down the line. They've been working on their music. They'd love to get it out there, but maybe they don't know how, maybe they're nervous. You mentioned something there about putting the fear aside. I think a lot of us have fears around performing or sharing our creative abilities. What what would you say to someone in those shoes who wants to to make something happen with their music, but maybe isn't at that young now or never stage? Oh my gosh. I mean, I, I truly believe that it doesn't matter what age you're at. There is an audience out there for you. I've got people in my academy from age 16 to age 70 something. And they're, you know, these older people, they're out there performing. They're releasing CDs. They are, some of them, you know, maybe didn't even really get into the game until they had an entire corporate career and then retired. And this was their time to do music. Like it's never too late. And I know it sounds funny for me to say 32, but you know, some, some people they've been told, you know, once they turn 30, they're like, or sometimes even like 25, you know, once you're at a certain age, like no one's going to take you seriously or the industry is not going to care. And I say, who cares about the industry? You, I was never a part of quote, the industry. You know, I'm not this person who's like, Oh, I was a label artist. I was the, you know, no, I sold, you know, CDs at, you know, pulled them out of the back of my car, sold them at events, um, you know, had a CD baby account, like, just like all the other independent artists, I wasn't doing anything that had a ton of backing, but I was making a steady living at it. And that is what I encourage artists, no matter what age you are, that you can do. Terrific. And we touched on a couple of things there, but I'd love to hear your perspective because you are so immersed in this world and you do do such good work to help people in that situation. What is it that holds people back? You know, apart from the fear that I'm older than 32, what, what, what might someone have on their mind that's stopping them from getting out there and selling their CDs from the boot of the car? Oh man. Um, there's a lot of things I think, you know, obviously confidence is one thing. Um, this, fear that, you know, people are going to criticize you. And yeah, they are like, I I try to be clear with all my students. Everyone's going to have haters. It doesn't matter. You know, I always say it's a badge of honor once you get a hater, because that means you put yourself out there enough that enough people have taken notice of you that you've got that, you know, that percentage has, there's always that like 1% that there's going to be haters. And you've, you've reached that threshold where you now have a hater. Good job. Like you're, you're actually putting yourself out there enough to have attracted one. <laughs> so getting over the fact that there's always going to pe- be people that don't like your music. You know, they might say, oh, who do you think you are? You're 60 years old and you're putting out an album. You know, who cares? You know, there's 99 people that are saying that's awesome. I'm so impressed. 
So that's one thing. Um, Another thing is, I mean, there's so many, like some of it has to do with kind of being what I call a scattered creative where we um, just, we have so many ideas and so many projects and we get, you know, get our fingers in a bunch of things and we start a bunch of things and we never finish any of them. So like, there's so many people out there that have, you know, 100 like songs that have one verse or one chorus and they've never finished any of them. And it's, it's really easy to get into that position when you're creative because you've always got all these amazing ideas that come to you. So I kind of, I help students like organize that and, and get it under control and put some productivity into their, into their day, into their week. So they know exactly what they should be doing. And they're not like constantly following these, you know, squirrels <laughs> that, that come in into their brain, which I mean, I'm never going to knock the fact that creative people have, are amazingly creative and have tons of ideas. You just need to, to get those under control, like know how to control them. So that's one thing. Um, people also think, you know, maybe they're a mom and they have kids and they think they can't do it. Well, I had a two year old when I recorded my first professional album, I dragged her on tour with me. Um, my biggest year as a touring artist I had a five-year-old and I was pregnant with my second one. So it can be done. It definitely can be done. It's just, you know, I'm, I wasn't playing bars, <laughs> you know, it, you're, you're playing house concerts and you're playing um, events and, and you're playing, um, I was doing a lot of women's events. You're doing fundraisers. You're doing the kind of events that make sense for you in the lifestyle that you have. You're not, out till 3 a.m. playing bars. <laughs> and who wants to do that anyway? That's what I say. <laughs> Nobody's listening to you anyway, so don't even waste your time with that. that that's such a valuable observation. And I, I know that a lot of people listening will have been in that position of thinking, I have my songs, but they're not a fit for this one performing opportunity, or I don't have enough songs for a full set to book a gig, or, you know, they have some notion of the one performance opportunity that's either there or not there. But I, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about what what could be the outlet for people's music in this day and age if they have that urge to share it, but they don't really know what the options are. Oh, there's so many. I mean, like you said, if if... I always encourage people to build up their confidence and build up their ability to communicate with an audience in say an open mic or a coffee shop somewhere where you're not getting paid or you might be getting tips, but you can always use that as a testing ground, both for yourself and for your material. So you can, you can build up your ability to really communicate with an audience to um, have good stage banter, be comfortable up there um, not just like get up there, sing a song and then go. And my next song is, you know, you need to have a personality up there and why not develop that in a place where there's not that pressure of like, someone's paying me, I have to be at a certain level. Um, in, especially with like an open mic, you're dealing with an audience that doesn't know you or know your music. And so that's like the toughest audience you can deal with. So if you can handle them, you can handle any audience. Because, you know, hopefully, eventually you're going to be performing to places where you're bringing in some of your own audience or, you know, you're, you have entirely your own audience. So I would definitely start there. And there are, you know, there are opportunities like house concerts where you can just say to your friend, like, hey, wouldn't it be fun to have a concert at your house? And you can invite all your friends and, you know, it can be really casual. And, you know, even if it's just 20 people, it's a great opportunity to get your music out there and get to know people that might like to know your music. And if you only have a few songs, just combine with another artist, you know, put something together, do it in a house setting and say, you know, you're going to get two or three artists in one sitting. How fun is that? Terrific. Uh, I, there were a couple of really important points there. I think, you know, one is what you said about open mics, because I think a lot of people have in mind the open mic is the easy option. But as you just said, you know, that can actually be one of the most intimidating performance situations mm -hmm. because it is a cold crowd. And I think the other there is that, uh, you know, a big theme on this podcast is the question of talent and people worrying that they don't have talent in music or they're not talented enough to do something or other. 
And I love that you recommend that progression of performing so that you don't need to step up on stage and say, I'm a superstar. You can just enjoy performing with your friends and family or a buddy who's a musician, and you can work your way up to the confidence that your music is worth sharing. Yeah, I think people, they think like, I'm not a real musician unless I'm being paid. So I should go out and seek all these paid opportunities. But really, you have to earn those paid opportunities. And if you don't have a a proven track record of being able to do well in open mics and coffee shops and places in busking or whatever, where you're performing for free or for tips, like what right do you have to say, I deserve this paying gig. Absolutely. And on that note, then, supposing someone's got past that concern about performing and they're finding ways to get themselves out there, what holds musicians back from making money with their music? Mm, Well, one thing I haven't mentioned, actually, and it's not as much related to money, but I do want to mention this because it's a big one for people, especially solo artists. Um, What can hold them back is that they think they need to have a band. Um, a lot of them are like, well, I'm not, I'm not, you know, official or I'm not legitimate if I don't have a band or I can't really compete in this setting if I'm just solo. Or they say, I don't have the chops to play by myself and sing without anyone backing me. And I know I went through this. Like I, I had a band. I put together a band when I first started on my solo career, but I found that most of those band members had full-time jobs. We could not be mobile and reactive. And I couldn't say like, oh, I'm going to book this gig because I'd have to call five people and see if they could all be there. And especially if it was like a fundraiser or a women's event that was during the day that was out. So I finally had to say, you know what? Like, I know I don't feel comfortable with my piano skills as you know, while I'm singing, like, I feel very uncomfortable with that. But I finally just needed to bite the bullet and say, I need to, I just need to practice like heck, like I need to focus on this as long as it takes me so I can actually be self-contained and book myself. And I thought it was going to take months and it actually only took a month to be to the point where I was competent enough. Now I had to say to myself, well, you can't play these arrangements the way that you hear them on the CD. You need to make this simpler so you don't, you know, stress yourself out and you don't detract from your singing. And, you know, I see this with my students all the time. They think it needs to sound exactly like it is on the CD. (laughs) And like, no, first of all, they're coming, they could just turn on the CD if they wanted to hear that. They're coming to see a different experience and also they don't they don't have a side by side comparison they're not going oh well you didn't play that chord there i was expecting you to play that little riff and i didn't hear it you know you know like just play the basics so you can get across what's more important which is the lyrics and the vocals of what you're doing so that is a big one um because obviously you can't go book yourself and make money if you're held by a back by the fact that either you think you need a band and you don't have one or you've got a band and you can't take them with you. I mean, it was allowed me to go on tour and be totally mobile. There's no way I could have done that with my band. And then I occasionally I do a local event that was a bigger event, a festival or something, and I would bring my band, but it didn't limit me. So that was one thing. And then I just think with the making money, I think mindset is so much of it. Um, I recently did a a podcast with a friend of mine, Greg Wilna, talking about money blocks, because I think that that is a lot of it. Like we think that either we don't deserve to get paid or we have this idea of the musician being the starving artist. Um, we see other people being willing to do it for free. And so we think we have to do the same because we can't compete with free. And my opinion is like, you'll never be able to compete with free. The only way you can compete with free is charging what you're worth and knowing that you're worth it. That's great. I think a lot of people fall into that trap of thinking, you know, I need to work for free because I'm not a real musician. I'm not good enough. Or 
you know, I'll, I'll do this for three years and then when I achieve such and such, then I can charge a full-time wage for what I do and I'll make a living. I love the way you describe it because it's clear there is some middle ground there. There's a progression from, you know, working your way up in terms of confidence and in terms of self-worth and valuing your music to get to the point where you're very comfortable and confident saying this is what it's worth for me to perform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I know you have a particular framework that can help musicians approach this whole topic. I wonder if you'd mind sharing a little bit about that, your profit path framework. Sure. So it's, it's kind of a five stage progression from, you know, just totally starting out to being what I call a professional, which doesn't necessarily mean you're doing music full time, but you're being, you're being paid what you're worth. You have a fan base, you know, that's following you and supporting you. And so it, there are five stages, which I can't like go into all the details, but um, the stages are the foundation, the promotion, the expansion, the automation and the profession. And, you know, you start out in the foundation, you've got no assets, like you don't have a website, you don't have your social media built um, and you just get all that in place. And that's also the time on the performing side where you are doing open mics and you're doing, um, <clears throat> you know, coffee shops and, and singing for tips and things. And then from there, you go on to the promotion where you're starting to get yourself out there, especially in the local market. You are um, hopefully booking some house concerts. So you've moved up from just doing these open mics to like having enough, a few little cohort of fans that would be willing to house you for a house concert or go to one. Um, and then, you know, at that point you can actually start making a little money and you're building your email list along the way. I've got kind of like little benchmarks of how many people you should have on your email list and what you should be doing on social media. And, you know, as you get into like the expansion, your email list is getting bigger. You're able to do more, more things, um, to relate with your fan base. You're obviously getting into bigger gigs um that are more you know more than house concerts you're actually being paid to perform at small venues and festivals and stuff and and so it just keeps moving up and like when you get into the the automation then you're starting to set up some systems so you can automate you know when people come into your email list you're welcoming them you're giving them a series of emails to let them know a little bit about you and establish in a relationship and eventually get them to buy some of your music. And, you know, then you move into the stages where I feel like it is okay to, to crowdfund. Um, I personally don't think you should be crowdfunding until you have at least a thousand people on your email list, if not more, but crowdfunding is hard and you know, you need to, to have that. People think they can just go out as a new artist and crowdfund. And yeah, you have like, you know, you're maybe your little local following, but that's not going to get you to where you need to know it, go with crowdfunding. So I think it is a lot less stressful to crowdfund if you already have a certain level of fan base, you know, and then you're getting into things like, okay, should I get a PR agent? Should I get a booking man? Should I get a booking agent? Should I get a manager? Um, all of that as you're getting into that professional stage, should I hire people to help me, uh, you know, virtual assistants and things. And so it just kind of gives people a framework because I think what happens is people see other artists doing things and they think, oh, I need to be doing that. Well, that artist might be on, you know, stage four, or stage five, and you're on stage one, like you don't need a virtual assistant when you don't yet have a website and you haven't established your social media and you're just performing at open mics. Right. But I think people get this, this uh, fear of missing out, or they think that they just want to do everything that an artist that they're following is doing, not realizing that, you know, when that artist was in the earlier stage, they weren't doing those things. So I think there's a healthy progression of, of how to do these things. And it, it, it will help save you not only time, but money to do the things in the right order, which is why I created the framework. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that because it, it is, I think just incredibly valuable to lay things out like that. And, you know, you're not saying you have to strictly do things in this order. It's just, right. it gives people that mental model of where does that successful artist career come from? Because I, I think a lot of people get tripped up by looking at the full picture 
and imagining they need to leap straight there, which suddenly gives you a thousand things to do if you want your music to be heard. But the way you've laid it out, there's a very clear progression and a way to think about how you build it step by step. Yeah. And I always tell them like, this is, if I could go back in time and do my career again, this is what I would do knowing what I know now. I realize that most of you have not done it in this order and that's okay. Like the biggest one is I encourage them not to record a full album until the stage three, because I want them to build up their, you know, stage experience. I want them to build their fan base and, you know, based upon live performances and, you know, most of them have already recorded an album, paid a bunch of money to do that, but yet have no website, no social media, no way to promote it, no audience. And so, you know, I always talk about this, this, uh, gar- your garage being your, your storage area for boxes and boxes of CDs. Like how many of us have had that? Like I definitely did that, you know, with one of the bands that I was in a long time ago and, we had no way to no fan base, no nothing to like sell those. We just thought, Oh, we'll just do this CD. And then all of a sudden they'll all come. And that's not how it works. Yeah. I I learned that (laughs) fallacy through painful experience myself on the business side, you know, the, if, if you build it, they will come or if your product is good enough, it will magically just have customers appear. Turns out those things are not true. So yeah, I I love that you're equipping people with the step-by-step because I I think that will save a lot of pain and time and money. I know, and I think sometimes artists think think that we're trying to punish them by saying like, I don't want you to do this until stage three. I'm just trying to protect you. Like you can do (laughs) it, it's fine, but I'm just telling you what happened to me and I don't want that to happen to you, so. So you've mentioned a few different options there in terms of making money with your music. And uh, I think to be clear for anyone listening, Bree and I aren't talking about, you know, making an amazing salary every year, rock solid income as a professional musician necessarily. Maybe that's you. But we're also talking about just making some side income or something in the middle between making no money with your music and making all of your money from your music. I I wonder, Bree, could you talk a little bit about your recent summit. You have organized this phenomenal summit with amazing speakers all about the topic of being a profitable musician. Yeah. I mean, I was, once I got the idea for this, I was so excited because what I wanted to do was to give artists a huge smorgasbord of op, of options of how to make money from music, because whether you're a hobbyist and you just want to break even on your music or, you know, not be spending all of your savings on recording an album or, you know, doing a tour, but being able to actually break even on that or even bring in a little bit of money, or you just, you want to have a career as a musician. I wanted to give a bunch of options. So people knew like, it's only, it's not only about performing live at bars, you know, like there's, these other eight ways I can perform live. And, you know, there's these other things that I could do even just from home without leaving my home that I could do to make money from music. And, um, you know, there's these other ways that I can do it through building a community. So I wanted to bring together, I ended up bringing together 40 different speakers um, and they talked about 33 different streams of income throughout the summit that you musicians can use to make money. And I realized like, I didn't do it to overwhelm you. Like, I don't want you to do 33 different streams of income. I want you to be able to look at those, hear the speakers and say, that sounds like something I could do, or that is really interesting. I think I'm going to look into that. And so obviously I don't want you to try to do all of them, but I want you to pick a few, especially maybe some that you're not doing yet that interest you or ones that you're doing now, but you feel like you're not making enough money or you're, you're not doing it to the best of your ability and learn from the speakers on how to do that better. Fantastic. And I, I knew just, just looking at the speakers list that this would be an inspiration packed event for anyone. You know, there's so much in there that you will go away and be excited to put into action. If you could just describe a little bit what is an online summit for anyone who hasn't come across this idea before and is intrigued by what we just talked about. Sure. It's it's basically a conference that's held online. So if you've been to, you know, the Taxi Road Rally or the CD Baby DIY Musician Conference, it's like that. You know, you can go into different rooms and hear speakers. Um, but with a, an online summit, 
every day new speakers um, come, you know, become available for you to listen to. And you can actually listen to them at your leisure for like that 48 hour period that they're available. So instead of at say a DIY musician event, there may be two speakers happening at the same time and you don't get to, you only get to choose one or, you know, they're happening all day and you're just exhausted. You can't go to another talk. This, in this situation, we had anywhere from four to six speaker, um, videos that were released every day and you could watch them at your own leisure and learn at, you know, some people had to prioritize and they were watching the ones that really related to them. Like I said, the streams of income that interest them. Um, some people tried to watch them all, <laughs> but, um, you know, for those that didn't have time or just wanted to be able to watch them over and over and learn more from them and get our specific action plans that we created for each one, we did create an all access pass, which means that you can go back and watch any of them forever and ever. Uh, you can get the access plans that my, I mean, the um, action plans that my partner Steve created that basically give you a rundown of here's what you learned during this talk. And here's what you should do to go out and implement it right now. Um, and, you know, you can, you can watch those forever, all 40 of them. So we created the all access pass for that because, you know, we did offer it for free for people for 48 hours, but it's really hard to consume all of that content. So it's like, you know, buying an all access pass is like paying a conference fee. Um, but, you get to watch them whenever you want, as long as you want. So we, now that the summit is over, we have that available to anybody that wants to go ahead and, and grab the all access pass. Amazing. Perfect. Well, we'll definitely have a link in the show notes to that for anyone who wants to check out more information or consider that all access pass. And, um, one thing we haven't touched on yet, which is actually how I discovered you and your work in the first place, is your podcast, the Female Entrepreneur Musician Podcast. And I'd love if you could share a little bit about where that show came from and, and what what you cover in that podcast. Sure. So um, one thing that we haven't talked about, which is how that show came to be, is that I have had an online, um, it started as an online radio station in 2007 called Women of Substance Radio. And it was a platform that I created to promote female artists because I felt like they were underrepresented. You know, I'd turn on the radio or I'd turn on Sirius XM and 80 to 90% of what I heard was male artists. So my goal with that was to create a platform for women um, in all genres. And I grew that from like nothing <laughs> in 2007 to being like a commercial online station and eventually um, turning it into a podcast in 2014. And so, uh, and so we still have the podcast. The, the online station has actually um, been retired just because people have moved more from online radio to podcasts. And that end of our business was growing so much faster that we just doubled down on the podcast. Um, obviously, you're a podcaster, so you know how great podcasting is. Um, so, you know, we feature... 10 songs um, on a show three days a week by female artists in all genres. So after all these years and working with thousands of female artists, I was like, you know, this, this, the music by these artists is so great, but a lot of them don't know how to promote themselves. They don't have the business skills. They don't even realize they're in business. They're just kind of waiting for some PR person or some radio person to come along and, and promote them. And a lot of them are wasting a lot of money on things they shouldn't be spending money on. Um, so I started the podcast to, to help with that and also to, you know, bring the stories of successful female artists to the forefront um, that are making a living from music to inspire these other people um, that were struggling on how they could do it. And so I started that in April 2015, knowing in the back of my mind that I probably was going to open this academy um, which would be courses for female artists and, and a membership site. And I did end up opening that in June. 2015. So we are at our three year anniversary now of the Female Musician Academy. And so the Female Entrepreneur Musician podcast is like, it's like the, it's like the gateway drug or the, the entry point for, um, for female artists to see kind of what I'm about, 
the way that I teach and to be inspired by other artists that they can do it and they can have a career. Absolutely. I have loved listening to your interviews. The inspiration is certainly the word. And it's also very educational. I guess a little bit, a bit like our own podcast, it's a mix of interviews and kind of teaching episodes. And I love, I think you do them mm -hmm. as live Facebook sessions or live video sessions yeah. anyway. Um, so you can involve some of the listener comments. But you've done some fantastic ones recently. So we'll definitely have a link in the show notes. And don't be put off if you are a male listener to this show um, I think a lot of the advice and inspiration in there is going to be just as relevant for you too. Um, Absolutely. I would love to hear a little bit more about the Female Musician Academy because it's obviously drawing on a lot of your experience and observing the barriers and frustrations that aspiring female musicians have. I, I wonder if you could address this question I just touched on of whether male and female musicians have a different challenge ahead of them and, and why it's the Female Musician Academy. Yeah, I mean, I do think that that females do have more barriers in front of them. Um, some of those things have come to the forefront, obviously, very recently with the Me Too movement and Time's Up and everything. Um, I, I think those are extremely valid. And I, I just want to preface this with saying, like, I'm not a male basher whatsoever. I have a husband. I love men. Um, but I did feel like women needed a place where they could be together with other women and have more of a, like a sisterhood of supporting each other and not feel like they need to be posturing or anything, which women do tend to do. I mean, when men are around, sometimes we feel like we need to prove ourselves or, you know, are, don't aren't willing to be vulnerable because it might be embarrassing. And the things that are able to be done in the Female Musician Academy when we're on our live calls, like people are able to be vulnerable. They're able to share their struggles. They're able to like break down if, if something is really upsetting them. And I don't think those things would happen in mixed company. So that was kind of the idea behind it to begin with, uh, a safe place for female artists to get support. And obviously there's the, the teaching aspect as well. So I've built the academy around the five stages that I talked about earlier. And we've got people in the academy everywhere from the beginnings of the foundation stage to in there are a couple of them that are in the profession stage at this point. So it's a great hierarchy of like people being able to mentor other people, which I think is great. And, and just like any kind of mastermind experience, people specialize in different things. People are good at different things. Some of them, you know, they've used Facebook ads and they're good at them and they can help others. And some of them are really good at, you know, doing house concerts and they can help others. They each have their, you know, some of them have, whenever somebody runs a crowdfunding campaign, I always recommend that they you know, post in there to ask for advice because there's several people in there that have done crowdfunding campaigns and can, you know, can help and, and aid in somebody that's new to it. So I just think that the collective experience is important. The female aspect was really important for me as well, because of that. I want people to be able to be vulnerable, to be able to to seek support in a group where they felt like people understood them. And there are things that happen to women in the music industry that don't happen to men. I mean, just even as simple as like people assuming if you're, you know, if you're a great female guitarist and you're going to a gig and you walk in, people might assume that you're, the girlfriend of the guitarist, you know, that, that happens all the time. There's just this assumption that like, Oh, you couldn't be the star of this show because you're a female. And it's, it's a bummer that it's true, but, it, and I think, I think we're doing a lot of work to break out of that, but it's still there. That makes perfect sense. And as you say, you, you are doing fantastic work, both with the podcast and with the Academy to hopefully both address some of those issues, but also help the individual musicians traverse them and find their way to a career that they're happy with or a musical identity that they're confident with and out there sharing with the world. Yep. That's, that's what my hope is. And it's been an amazing, amazing three years. And, you know, some people come 
most people come for the training and they end up staying because the community is so amazing. They're, the average length that people stay in the academy so far is, you know, at least two years. Uh, so, and, you know, there's people that came in in the beginning and they're founding members and they're members for life, which is awesome because they jumped in at the beginning and had faith in me when there was no such thing as the academy and there were no courses inside. So, you know, those people get obviously a special treatment because they, they had faith in me from the beginning, but you know, the, you know, the average length that people stay really is like one to two years plus, and we've only been going for three years. So we'll see. I mean, I hope these hope some of the amazing ladies in the Academy are still around in 10 years. Fantastic. And for anyone listening, I'll just refer back to a previous episode we've done about online courses where we talked about, you know, the typical course completion rates to give you some idea, the average online membership website, people stick around typically for three or four months. So to hear of one that has people around for two years is, is really outstanding. And I think it's a testament to the community you've created there. That's wonderful. So part of the reason I was asking about that, why it's the, the Female Musician Academy, is that looking at the information online, I, I was so excited by the training you're providing and I, I instinctively wanted to join myself, but then I thought, no way, I'm not, I'm not a female musician. I wonder if you could share a little bit about what's available online for people who aren't ready to join the academy for whatever reason, whether that's gender or money or it's just not the right time. What else could they look at online to learn more about your teaching and the kind of things we've talked about today? Yeah, absolutely. So with this, this summit, um, I kind of created this brand of the Profitable Musician brand, and I am going to be, um, maybe by the time this podcast is even out, uh, creating a secondary area um, in my world called the Profitable Musician Academy. And that's going to help people that either, like you said, don't want to be part of a membership site or are a male artist, and they just want to access my courses, like one-off courses. Like you can buy those now, but they're not as easily found because they're kind of hidden within the academy. Um, but, you know, I've got a bunch of courses that are just a, a single course. For example, Profitable House Concerts is a course. Um, um, Facebook Ads for Musicians is a course. Um, Double Your Productivity and Profit from Music is my goal setting course. You know, I've got all these great courses and people don't necessarily know about them because they've all been, they are part of the Academy. Like if you join, you get access to all of those, but I'm going to do a better job of making those accessible to more people because I just, I think they can really help people. Absolutely. Well, I, I've so enjoyed talking with you today, Bree, and having the chance to pick your brains a little bit about how musicians can get out there and, and maybe even start making some money with their work. What's the best place for people to learn more about all of your projects? At this point, it's definitely femmusician.com. That's F as in female, E as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur, musician.com, femmusician. And that's where you can um, go check out the podcast. We have like 160 something episodes now of fantastic content, interviews, teaching. Um, go subscribe on iTunes. And, you know, you'll get a new podcast once or twice a week delivered directly to you. And like I said, there's pretty much everything in there, um, except the very occasional episode applies to both genders. Um, I just, it was important to me to create it around my brand of wanting to serve females originally because I wanted to attract the right people to what I do. And so that's where to go, femmusician.com. Fantastic. Well, we will have a link to that and all of your projects, um, direct links in the show notes for this episode. Thank you again, Bree, for joining us today. You are welcome. This has been so fun. Want to know how musical you are and how to improve? Find out free at musicalitypodcast.com slash checklist. Well, I said at the start that this episode was going to open up some new possibilities in your mind about getting your music out there. What did you think? Let's do a quick recap. Bree grew up singing and found success in school choirs and a cappella groups before going on to study for a music degree. Interestingly, due to a vision impairment, she always found reading from sheet music a challenge, which caused her to focus on developing her musical memorization skills, something that she found really helped her to deliver compelling performances later on, since she wasn't bound to the sheet music and she could relate more easily to the audience in front of her 
and engage them in her performance. That idea of getting off the sheet has come up on the podcast before, and I'm definitely a believer that the real music making starts when the note reading stops. After college, Brie worked on developing a career in music as a singer songwriter, but it wasn't all smooth sailing. Despite having a dual degree in music and business, she found she hadn't been equipped with the tools and strategies needed to make a living or get her music heard more widely. Over the years, she tried various approaches she saw others using, and she tried to follow along with what they seemed to be doing, but it wasn't until she hit a now or never moment in her early 30s that she grappled with the fact that it was going to be up to her to craft her own music career and figure out for herself what works. That journey may have been painful, but it led to some real success, including recording records, winning awards, going on tour, and singing the national anthem at Dodger Stadium. And clearly it set the scene for the work she would later do in helping other aspiring female musicians to craft their own careers in music. After noticing a strong gender imbalance in the music she heard on the radio, Brie was inspired to start an online radio station back in 2007, dedicated to showcasing female artists called Women of Substance Radio. In 2014, this became a podcast which now publishes a new episode every weekday. Through that project, Brie realized the major need for training to help musicians, and female musicians in particular, to overcome the barriers that hold them back from performing and making money with their music, and this led to the launch of the Female Entrepreneur Musician podcast and her Female Musician Academy. It was great to unpack these topics a bit with Brie and get a sense of the sheer variety of options available in this day and age. As I said during the conversation, I think a lot of musicians fall into that trap of thinking it's all or nothing. Either they're a total pro making a living with their music, or they do it purely for the love as a hobby. That they're either up there on stage selling out shows, or they should just play by themselves at home. I loved how Brie described the stepping stones that can be there for you to build up your confidence and get practice performing at a pace you're comfortable with and in a way that leads to the opportunities you actually care about. The same goes for the money-making side of things. There are just so many possibilities these days, it's not a matter of being paid for gigs or lessons and that's it. This is most clearly demonstrated by her recent Profitable Musician Summit, where she had no less than 33 different streams of income laid out by 40 expert speakers. And if you're at all curious to know what some of those might be, and whether there are a few that could be a fit for you, then definitely check out the link to that in the show notes for this episode. I am a keen listener of Bree's podcast, Female Entrepreneur Musician, and I really admire the work she's doing at the Female Musician Academy. She was very polite as I bumbled my way into asking why it's specifically all labelled as being for women, and I loved her answer, that there is such value to her members in being part of an all-female community, and that despite the name, she would agree that a lot of her online resources and podcast episodes can be super useful for musicians of both genders. So if you're listening to this as a female musician, then do check out the Academy, And if you're listening to this as any type of musician at all, then do check out her podcasts, both Women of Substance Radio and Female Entrepreneur Musician, and keep an eye on femusician.com for the latest on her online courses and training. I hope that whatever stage you're at, whether you're starting out in music making, or you've reached the ripe old age of 32, or perhaps you're returning to music late in life, I hope this episode has provided some inspiration and encouragement for what might be possible in terms of sharing your music, getting out there and performing, and maybe even making some money with the music you love. Thanks for joining me for this episode. Stay tuned for our next one, where we'll be talking more about online courses by finishing up our two-parter on how to choose and succeed with online music courses. Thank you for listening to the Musicality Podcast. This episode has ended, but your musical journey continues. Head over to musicalitypodcast.com where you will find the links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive for podcast listeners.